Hi guys, so we'll be starting at 5 5. Hang in there. Hello guys, so uh, this session will be about prefix sums and frequency arrays. So I'm Radesh, I'm a coordinator of programming club IIT Madras. So uh, this is a QR code for today's attendance. Uh, please scan it. Uh, I'll give you a few, one or two minutes for this. So please scan it in the meanwhile. Okay, guys, so uh, I'll be moving on to the next slide now. So uh, we'll share this attendance link again later. So uh, yeah, let's move on for now. So first, let's start with a question. Uh, 
let us say there are n integers in a line. Uh, so the first line of the input contains some integer n and the next line contains some n integers. Uh, say we are given uh, Q queries. Uh, the ith query is a pair of integers a comma b and uh, we have to find the sum of all integers from the ith one to the bth one and we have to output these uh, values. Uh, I will show you an example test case for this. Uh, so this is what I mean. I basically mean that uh, there are some numbers. Let's say here there are seven numbers and these are the numbers, let's say. And then we are given three queries. So uh, let's say these are the three queries. So I basically want to find uh, the sum of uh, numbers between these uh, like indices kind of. So uh, let's take the first one. Uh, first one, the first query is one four. So uh, we have to add the numbers from uh, the first number to the fourth number. We'll get 14 there. From the second number to the seventh number, that is 27. And from the fifth number to the sixth number, that is six. So this is what I mean, uh, kind of. So uh, that is what we have to find and think about how how would how would we solve this. So first, you would just think that we would go through every single query and uh, we would add all the numbers uh, just by doing it. Uh, like uh, we would just go through every every query and just start at the first number and end at the last number and just print every sum like that. So that is the first uh, possibility we can do. Yeah, so uh, how would we do that? We would uh, first take the input of n and then we would uh, create an array for n. We would take all these uh, integer inputs. We would take these seven numbers as the input and we would put them in ARR array. Then we also have a uh, Q queries. So you would define Q, you would take input of Q, and then uh, you would uh, take each of these queries, like uh, you would take input for each of these queries, A comma B, uh, and then uh, you would start sum equal to zero, and then you would uh, increment the sum from the Ath element to the Bth element, and then uh, you would have to uh, also output this sum we cannot uh, we'll have to output it here i guess i had not uh, add that statement so uh, yeah uh, what do you think the time complexity for this would be uh, scan this qr code and one second i will start it uh, so scan this qr code and uh, give your answer for what do you think the time complexity for uh, such algorithm would be. You can, I think you can also get this key, uh, this link on uh, WhatsApp also. So I'll give you one more minute guys to decide uh, what the time complexity is for this and then we'll I'll move on to explain uh, how did we come to it.
Okay, cool guys. I think uh, that was enough time. Uh, let us see the results. So uh, it looks like 76% of you said. Uh, one second. It looks like 76% of you said it is uh, having time complexity NQ. And yes, that is the correct answer. Uh, let us go ahead and see. So uh, why the time complexity NQ? Uh, so basically, uh, for each query, uh, at most, we will have to do N operations uh, because uh, when we have uh, a is equal to one and b is equal to n then we will have to add n elements so uh, for each query you'll have a uh, time com time complexity o n and there are q queries so the time complexity would be o n into q okay i guess that was a simple question uh, let's move on so uh, is it possible to make this more efficient like o n q that is like uh, it doesn't seem to me that it is the most efficient algorithm. Can we find a more efficient algorithm? If yes, let's see how. We can actually do this by using prefix sums. So first, let's learn about prefix sums. Okay. So first, let me define a prefix sum, and then we'll get to the algorithm and all. So a prefix sum array, our set of integers, is basically it would have a n plus one elements if there are n integers and uh, let us say uh, the prefix sum is an array that is called ps so uh, we'll define this as uh, ps n plus one and this data type can be anything it, it can be anything like integer float or uh, it can be a double or anything like that any number basically so uh, basically prefix sum uh, with the index i is the sum of the first i elements of the uh, array of n integers. So basically, uh, if we have like a PS5, uh, that would basically mean PS5 should equal the sum of the first five elements uh, like of the uh, of the previous array. And we say that PS0 uh, that is defined to be zero basically. Uh, let me explain using this example. So basically, uh, here PS of zero would be zero, PS of one would equal one, PS of two would equal five, PS of three would equal eight, PS of four would equal fourteen, etc. So uh, how is this useful? Uh, can you form any and uh, basically first we have to find all these p uh, prefix sums. So for that uh, we'll be using a recursive relation. Uh, what do you think this recursive relation is? Uh, scan this QR code and uh, you can uh, submit your answers for the poll uh, of what do you think the recursive relation is? I'll give you uh, maybe one and a half minute for this.
okay guys i think uh, that is enough time to answer this question uh, let us see what the poll has to say and then i'll explain which is correct okay so it looks like 67% go with this 22% go with this 1% go with this and 9% go with this uh, so so actually the correct answer is the second one uh, i will tell you why uh so basically uh psi is the sum of the first i elements of uh, the array arr so uh, what does that mean that basically means that uh, for example let's go back here and see let's say uh, there is ps5 ps5 is the sum of the first five elements so that is the sum of 1 plus 4 plus 3 plus 6 plus 1 so uh, if you want to write a recursive relation between ps5 and ps4 here uh how would we do that we would say that ps5 is equal to this one plus ps4 right so uh, and what is this one this one is basically arr of 4 not a r r of 5 so uh, that was the thing here that is why most of you put uh, the first option actually but it is actually the second option so uh, i made this question so that you all would understand the importance of indices and all so we can observe that psk is equal to psk minus 1 plus a r r of k minus 1 for in, for any index k so that is how we find the prefix sum basically using this recursive relation so uh, we first uh, define uh, the prefix sum as uh, int ps n plus 1 then we define ps 0 to be 0 because uh, the sum of the first zero elements is basically 0 and uh, then uh, we uh, make a loop so ps i is equal to ps i minus 1 plus a r r of a i minus 1 so uh, we loop this for uh, indices of we loop this through the whole uh, prefix sum array and we find all the prefix sums so that is basically how we find the prefix sum array so after this how do we apply this to the problem let's see so uh, this is this is how we apply prefix sum method to the problem observe that uh, ps of k is equal to uh, a of 0 plus a of 1 plus a of 2 until a of k minus 1 uh now uh, let's say we have some query which is a comma b so we have to find the sum of the elements uh some the sum of uh, elements from the ath one to the bath one uh, so basically uh, what would that be that would be uh, a r r of a until a r r of b uh also uh, this this should be arr by the way yeah fine okay whatever so uh, that would be arr of a until arr of b so uh, that is equal to uh, basically uh, arr of 0 plus arr of 1 until arr of b minus arr of 0 plus arr of 1 until arr of a minus 1 so uh, the required sum uh, would be p ps of b plus 1 minus uh, ps of a one second i may have made a mistake let me correct it
Uh, so basically, the sum for each query is this. It is the sum of all elements till b minus sum of all elements until the a minus one element. Uh, that is uh, kind of uh, intuitive. You can say that. So uh, here, once we find uh, the prefix sum, we can find the sum of each query in uh, O of one, which is better than O of n. And the time complexity to find the prefix sum, uh, that is O of n itself. So the total time complexity is O of k n plus q. Uh, so uh, I would say this is much better than O of n into q. So this method is better. So uh, this is a application of prefix sums, where we can find uh, the sum of all elements in a subarray. So uh, we have seen one application of prefix sums, that is sum of elements of a subarray. Uh, there are some of some more applications which I will I'll I'll tell you about this this second application. We won't be covering the third, third application today. So we we have seen uh, the subarray sum. So uh, the sum of all elements from the rth element, let's say, uh, the sum of all elements from the lth element to the rth element, that would be p s of r minus p s of l minus one. We have seen this in the previous question. This is how we basically used prefix sum in the previous question. So this is one application. It helps make uh, al al our algorithms a bit more uh, efficient and all. So yeah. Uh, so there is uh, another application where uh, we can use prefix sums uh, to find uh, uh, the max the maximum sum of k contiguous elements. So what do I mean by that? I basically mean that uh, let us take all subarrays of k contiguous elements and we want to find the maximum sum of that. So uh, normally you would think you can just use nested loops and find the, and find the maximum sum. But here you can do it a bit more efficiently using prefix sums itself. And you can do it in on itself instead of doing o n square i mean o n into k yeah. well, uh, how would we do this uh, let us first say uh, we create a variable called max and we assign max to be uh, p s of k that is the sum of the first k elements okay so then uh, we make a loop. We go from i equal to one until uh, i equal to n minus k. So uh, basically what I'm doing is for every i, I will find the sum of elements from the i. We'll find the sum of elements from like uh, the i -th element to the i plus k -th element. Okay. And if this sum is greater than max, we will set max equal to that sum. And finally, whatever uh, max we get, that is the largest sum of uh, k element subarrays. So we will uh, output that. So this is a uh, approach to find the maximum sum of a k element contiguous subarray. Okay, so. Uh, if you guys want, you can try it out and also. Okay, so uh, this is one more application of uh, prefix sums. We won't be covering this today. You can try it out later on your own if you want. This is to find the maximum subarray sum. Basically, what I mean is that uh, over all contiguous subarrays, uh, we want to find the maximum subarray sum. Uh, the length doesn't matter. Uh, so basically, uh, we can do this also by using prefix sums. We won't be covering this later. You can try it out later. 
so let us uh, try to solve a problem using prefix sums now uh, this is a problem on code forces uh, its name is promo and uh, let's let's try it out now so basically uh, there is a store which sells n items uh, the price of the ith item is pi the store's management is going to hold a promotion if a customer purchase purchases it at least x items he will get the y cheapest of them for free so uh, the management has not yet decided on the exact values of x and y and they ask you to process q queries for the given values of x and y determine the maximum total of the items received for free when a customer makes one purchase all the queries are independent they don't affect the store stock so uh, this is a example input let us see how it's written the first line contains n and q 5 is n and q is 3 uh n is the number of items in the store and q is the number of queries the second line contains n integers p1 to pn where pi is the price of the ith item and after that we have q lines each containing xi and qi so for every query we have to print one integer we have to print the maximum total value of items received for free on one purchase so uh, i guess i'll give you a few minutes to think about this then i will discuss the solution i'll discuss the solution at uh, 534 you can think about the logic till then even if you can't code it by then you can think about the logic and then i will discuss how to do it
okay so i'll discuss how we do this now uh, let us take uh, the example and uh, try to think how we would solve it in the example first i'll use the spreadsheet for this so uh, the numbers are 53152 so uh, we have 5 3 1 5 and 2 so these are the uh, these are the prices of uh, all the items so uh, when we are given a certain x and y let's say let's take uh, 3 and 2 right now and see how do we find uh, how do we find the maximum sum of the free stuff so uh, let's first sort these prices and see what happens it would it might give you a better idea so if we sort the items we have this we have 12355 so uh if the person buys three items he will get two items for free so how would he maximize the sum of those two elements let's say he buys maybe 1 2 then he'll get 1 and 2 for free let's say maybe he buys 1 2 and 5 then he'll get 1 2 for free but that is not the maximum right let's say he buys 5 5 3 then he'll get 5 and 3 for for free so basically you can see that uh, the maximum sum of uh, the free stuff would basically be when we take uh, the x most costly items here we take three elements the three most costly items and then we take the cheapest y items here which means the cheapest two items here which is 3 and 5 that would give us the maximum sum of free items so uh, let us try to implement this uh so basically first we have to take uh we have to take the input for n and q and then we make an array for the prices int p of n after that we sort the array p here after that we make a prefix some array ps of n plus 1 and then we find the prefix sums as we discussed before after that you might have a question of how we found uh, the required sum i'll tell you that also uh so basically uh, we want the sum of 3 and 5 here so that would basically be ps of 4 minus ps of 2 right and how do we decide that basically uh, we take uh, the sum of all these elements meaning the first four elements and then we subtract this these two elements so uh, that's how we found it so how would we put that into variables so let's see that so basically uh, how would we write the some of the first four elements that is basically ps of n minus x plus y right and the sum of the first two elements that is that is basically ps of n minus x so uh, this is the required sum this is the required sum and this would be the maximum of the free uh, items 
so basically uh, for every query of x and y we just output uh, this and basically that's it uh, this is uh, one more question but uh, we won't be going through this now uh, we will i teach you frequency arrays for now and if we have time we'll see this question at the end okay so let's start the next topic which is frequency arrays uh, so uh, let me start by just uh, telling you about let's just take some random integers and then let me say some stuff so uh, let's say we have an input of uh, several numbers here we have 12 numbers so there are some numbers here and let us form the frequency array here uh, here the frequencies of different numbers what are they here zero comes once one comes three times two comes three times three comes four times and four comes five times so uh, basically uh, by frequency array i just mean uh, we want to make uh, an array such that it contains the frequency of every possible element in this input so here how would we do that here we would take uh, we would first define the array the frequency array here the largest number is 4 so we would define it as int freq of 5 and i am writing equal to open bracket zero close bracket this basically means uh, i am assigning all the values to be zero initially and then we will iterate through every of these numbers and uh, whenever we encounter a number we will increase the frequency of that element in the frequency array so basically when it encounters one it will increment freq of one by one so we will loop it through this whole array and uh, yeah so the steps followed here are this basically the first step was uh, initializing a frequency array with uh, max plus one elements and uh, all the elements of uh, the frequency array are initially zero okay so uh, what is max here by the way max is basically uh, the maximum possible uh, number which can appear in the set of numbers in this set what is the maximum number it was 4 that's why we initialized it initialize it as peak of 5 so uh, this max will usually be given in problems as a constraint so after that uh, the second step is to iterate through the set of elements and we increment the corresponding element of the frequency array by 1 so that is how we form the frequency array uh the disadvantage of frequency arrays is when uh, there is a very large uh, maximum value let's say uh, let's say for instance there is a set of set of elements that has 100 numbers and each number lies between uh, 1 and 10 power 12 so we would need to create a frequency array with 10 power 12 plus one element so uh, this is one disadvantage of frequency arrays we can use maps instead of frequency arrays for better memory efficiency in such cases uh, you will learn about maps in future sessions don't worry about maps for now so uh, this is a question uh, let's try to solve it by frequency array method this is a question 1025a dog or recoloring you can check it on uh, code forces if you want 
and we'll I'll just uh, tell you what this problem is first of all. So panic is rising in a community for doggo standardization. The puppies of a new brood have been born multicolored. In total, there are twenty six possible colors of puppies, and these colors are denoted by letters A to Z. The committee rules strictly prohibit even the smallest diversity between doggos, and hence the puppy should be of the same color. Thus, Slava, the committee employee, has been assigned the task to recolor some puppies into other colors in order to eliminate the difference and make all the puppies have one color. Unfortunately, due to bureaucratic reasons and restricted budget, there is only one operation that Slava can do. he can choose a color x that currently has at least two puppies of color x and recolor all puppies of that color x into some arbitrary color y luckily this operation can be applied multiple times maybe even zero times for example if the numbers is puppies is 7 and their colors are represented by the string a b a b a b c then in one operation slava can uh change this to uh the this possible uh, cases he can do it all uh in the first case it looks like he has changed all a's to z in the second case it looks like he has changed all a's to b's in the third case it looks like he changed all b's to a's and in the third case it looks like he changed all b's to c's Uh, however if the current color sequence is a b a b a b c then he can't choose x c why can't he because there will be of the color c hello i think it was lagging uh, so uh, let's continue where we stopped i think uh, it stopped when i was discussing the question so uh, i'll just continue from there so uh, i think i st it stopped around here so we have to help slava and the committee determine whether it is possible to standardize all the puppies uh, after slava's operations all the puppies should have the same color so the input is such that the first line contains a single integer n the number of puppies the second line contains a string s of length n uh, the ith symbol is the color of the ith puppy uh, if it's possible to recolor all puppies into color print yes otherwise print no 
so uh, think about this for maybe 2 minutes 3 minutes uh think about the logic and then after that i can explain the logic Okay, so uh, now I'll discuss the logic behind this question. The implementation is pretty easy, so this so I won't be so I won't be discussing the implementation. So uh, let's say uh, there are some puppies out of uh, all the twenty six, uh, of which there are at least one puppy. Uh, so uh, observe that if there is exactly one puppy for every color that is there possible to do like any see this example so basically if it's like just a uh, then we can't do any operation if it's a b c d e we can't do any operation uh, although a is already done we would consider this to be uh, valid uh, we can just print yes for this i just mean that in these cases we can't do any operation so uh, see that if for any of the colors, if there are at least two puppies of the same color, then we can systematically color all the puppies into the same color. Think why and how. Basically, uh, you can see this example here. If you have this A, A, B, C, D, then we can change this A, A into Bs. So then we'll have B, B, B. Then we can change all these Bs into Cs. And then we can change all these Cs into Ds. So basically, there are at least two puppies in total. Then there has to be at least one color which has at least two puppies. Okay. What I mean is that. Uh, Let's here example there were five puppies. So 
there were two puppies for the color yes if it was like this a b c d e then the answer is no and if there is exactly one puppy in total anyways the answer is yes in that case like this 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 if there's just a the answer is yes so uh, we can use frequency arrays here we can form a frequency array for the uh, different colors we can form a frequency array for all the colors from a to z and if uh, and then uh, after that if the total number of puppies is exactly one we just print yes in initially if the total num total number of puppies is more than one then we go to this and then uh, we check if there is any color with at least two puppies if there is any color with at least two puppies then we just print yes else we just print no so that is the logic behind this you can try implementing it and we'll code so, so thank you and uh, scan this for attendance uh, i guess you will get this qr code for attendance uh, after the second session also i'll just leave it here then uh, the next mentor can take over Okay then, uh, Srivastava, you can take over now. Hello, am I audible? can hear you huh we can hear you okay okay so let's start today my topic is recursion and gcd so this is the qr for attendance uh, we already had it i'll show it at the last again so recursion is a uh, programming technique in which we a function calls itself to solve a problem we already know that uh, a function can call another function like main function is also a function it call it call it can call other functions similarly a function can also call other functions but a function can also call itself calling itself is what recursion is gcd is used to find the largest common divisors of two numbers basically it's the largest number which divides both the numbers. Actually, it can be extended to many numbers. For example, let's say we have three numbers, then GCD of three numbers will be the greatest number, which is uh, which divides all three of them. Now, uh, here we can see uh, example of recursion. In the main function, we have called the recursive function. What the recursive function does is call itself.
yeah so the recursion function calls itself as we can see here uh, so what happens is the control of the program goes like this the first main function start executing then the recursion function is called then the control goes to the recursion function within the recursion function the recursion function is called again so the control again goes to the recursion function and it keeps going like this and the lines in between are the commands which get repeatedly executed unless we put a stop to it to put a stop to it we define a base case uh, let's see how we do that so let's uh, If if you cannot see, you can tell me. I'll uh, extend. I'll increase the size. But for now, let's see. In this, uh, this is an example. This is not a recursion. I'll, I'll just show you. I'll build up towards recursion. In the first example, we are calling function called f, which uh, and we are inputting five five as the argument. So the function f accepts five as the argument. Prints phi and calls the function g. It gives six as the argument. Six g accepts six as the argument. Prints six and calls the function h. Function h accepts seven as the argument. Prints it and the program terminates there. Since these functions are void, 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 they don't need to return anything. Since void functions don't return anything. Another example is uh, sub. Uh, this is uh, we are calling the function f. We are giving phi is the input. We are printing phi. Then g function is called, and we giving we are giving six as the uh, argument. Now six is getting printed. And f function is being called with phi as the argument. Now again, phi will be printed in f function, and g will again be called with six as the argument. This process will keep on continuing, and our output will be phi six, phi six, phi six, phi six. Now, what if the function f calls itself instead of calling g f g f g? What if we have f f f f f f? So what is happening here is. F is taking phi as the input. It's printing phi. Then it's uh, calling itself with six as the argument. Now it will print six. Then it it will call itself with seven as the argument, and it'll keep doing that till infinity because we haven't we haven't put a stop this this program. Since these are all the void functions. This is the first example of recursion till now. Before we're not recursion, but this is an endless recursion. We need to put a stop to this somehow. So here we have a function. Here we need to. We are explaining the base case, which stops the function. Suppose I need to print five, six, seven. Only the till three numbers. So what I will write in my recursion function is if. The argument which it takes is this. It's seven. I will return seven. Basically, I'll return seven back to the main function, and I won't continue calling the function. So what 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 is happening here is when I'm calling this function f five, our control is going to this function. It's it takes five as the argument. Since five is not equal to seven, this if statement is not executed. And we come to this output statement where phi is outputted, and we return the value which function f c plus one returns. So the return of this function f would be here. Uh, notice that here we have changed from void to int. So you must know that all data types must return something. All function which uh, with data types must return something. So what they're returning, what this function is returning, is the value which f c plus one returns. So let's see what f c plus one will return. 
f c plus one is again a function called to f, where since uh, which takes c was five, so five plus one six as the argument. Now we see six is not seven, so this if statement won't be executed, and uh, we will print six. Now this f c this f c plus one will return s uh, f c plus one of the next one basically. So now that now this will take seven as input. Seven is argument. Since seven equals to seven, it will return directly from here, and this your statement won't be executed. This return statement won't be executed. There won't be any more loops in the recursion, and our recursion will break right here because our C became seven, five, six, seven. And and why is this seven getting printed? Because our F I is seven, and we, which we which we are printing in the main function. Okay. So let's take an exam. Let's look at an example of a recursive function. So this is a recursive function to find the factorial of a number. So as I told, we need the base case to stop the recursion. Otherwise, our recursion will keep on going to infinity. So first of all, we define zero factorial as one, which mathematics defines zero factorial as one, and one factorial is obviously one. So here we'll enter a number and uh, whatever we'll call the factorial of whatever the number we want. Yeah, so let's continue. Sorry for the disturbance. I'll full screen it. Yeah, so uh, this is the recursive function for factorial. Let's say we want to find factorial of five. Okay, so this, what are we doing is we are calling the factorial function here, which is getting stored in the variable called fact and which will which we will print afterwards. So now that factorial function is getting executed here. So we need to stop the uh, while recursing. We know we need to stop the recursion, which is the base case. And the where the recursion actually takes place is the recursive case. So what is five factorial? Five factorial is basically five into four factorial. Four factorial is what? Four into three factorial, right? So what we need to do here is uh, we can easily see that n factorial is n into n minus one factorial. So if what the base case is zero or one, if if we get zero factorial and one factorial, we'll return one to the function. Otherwise, what we will do is we will return n into factorial n minus one. What this is is basically if our n is five, we will be returning five into factorial four. Right. So what this factorial function is returning, it's returning five into the return value of the factorial n minus one. Now let's see what factorial n minus one will return since our n was five. Factorial n minus one will take four as input. Okay, it's it will take four as input since four is not zero and four is not one. Else statement will be executed, which will return four into factorial of three. So as we can see, what the original factorial function is returning is five into return value of factorial of n minus one, which is as we just saw four into return value of factorial n minus two, basically five into four into return value of factorial three. This will go on till we get uh, uh, one as 
pi into 4 into 3 into 2 into factorial 1. Now, when factorial 1, finally factorial 1 function is called again, we'll put it, it will take 1 as argument. Since n is equals to 1 now, it will return 1. So this else, no more recursive statement will be executed and the base case will be executed. Now, the recursion stops here. What will be returned is n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 till 1. Basically, that is what factorial is. And that will be returned to this fact uh, variable, which will be printed here. These are few examples. I think we can come to this later. So how the control flow of the program works, this program, I just told you how it works, but let's see again. So when I call factorial in, Within factorial n, if n is not 0 or 1, it else statement is getting executed and factorial n minus 1 is getting called. So our, it is calling function the function factorial again with uh, the argument n minus 1. This keeps on going till we reach the factorial 1, which returns 1, which multiplies with the factorial value uh, of 2 which returns it, which multiplies with the factorial value of 3 and it goes on and finally we get the return value of this as n into uh, n minus 1 and n minus 2, which is getting returned to the uh, factorial uh, factor in the main function, which is getting printed finally. So this is the control flow of how a recursion works, how factorial recursion works. So Every recursion, almost every recursion can be written as a, uh, almost every recursion, may, a lot of recursions can be written as iterations. Iteration, uh, recursion is basically uh, just uh, looping in a, in a way in which function calls itself. So we just saw how the factorial program works for the recursion. How it works for the iteration is basically we'll take, uh, we will take n as the input, as the argument. Suppose we need to find a factorial of y. We initialize fact as 1. We For i equal to 2 to n, we'll keep multiplying it to fact. And uh, that is basically 1 into 2 into 3 till n, and we'll return fact. Yes, this is a, a lot easier method than this, but uh, in some of the complex cases, we can't always uh, create an iteration for all recursions. Sometimes recursions are the only way to go. That's why learning recursion is important. Uh, now let's see recursion over Fibonacci numbers. So what are Fibonacci numbers? Fibonacci numbers are numbers such that which are some of their two immediate predecessors. What I mean is, let's say, take this 21. What is 21? 21 is the sum of 8 plus 13. Right? What is 55? 55 sum of 21 plus 34. So, what, what is the recursive relation for this function? For any, let's say, let's say this is 0, pip 0, this is pip 1, pip 2, pip 3, pip 4, pip 5, basically 0th position, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th position. So, let's say 5th, Six, fifth, six is eight. Okay. So, what is fib of n? Is fib of n minus one plus fib of n minus two, right? Because in this array of Fibonacci numbers, every nth element is a sum of n minus one plus n minus two element. This is the Fibonacci recursion. Okay. Now, uh, as you can see, the, for the first and second, there's no two numbers before the uh, zeroth position and there is no two numbers before the first position right so we define fib of 0 as 0 and fib of 1 as 1 with that we calculate fib of 2 as 1 right right here and fib of 3 with with that we calculate fib of 3 as 2 so let's find fib of 5 using uh, we already know what is fib of 5 0 1 2 3 4 5 fib of 5 is 5 okay so Let's find fib of phi using uh, our recursion function. Okay, so let's create a recursion function to find this. Since this is our recursion, 
what we need to stop it somewhere okay as you can see fib of 2 is sum of fib of 1 plus fib of 0 but fib of 1 and fib of 0 are not sum of any two predecessors so what we'll do is we'll set them as base case as soon as we get n to 0 we'll return 0 or if we get n as 1 we'll return 1 because fib of 0 is 0 and fib of 1 is 1 otherwise fib of n is fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2 so Let's see what's happening here. If we are going to find fib of phi, since phi is not 0 or 1, what this fib of phi function will return is fib of 4 plus fib of 3. Okay, now fib of 4, what will fib of 4 return? Fib of 3 plus fib of 2. What is fib of 3? Will return fib of 2 plus fib of 1. Similarly, fib of 3 will return fib of 2 plus fib of 1, fib of 2 will return fib of 1 plus 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So finally, what, what we will get is fib of 1 plus fib of 0 plus fib of 1 plus fib of 1 plus fib of 0 plus fib of 1 plus fib of 0 plus fib of 1. Since fib of 0 is 0, it's 0. And others are fib of 1 is coming 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times, right? So we'll get phi as the answer, which we get the output when we run this code. Now there's a clear repetition here. See, while when phi divides into fib of 4 plus fib of 3, fib of 4 divides into fib of 3 plus fib of 2. Okay. So the return value of this is fib of 4 is fib of 3 plus fib of 2. But we have already calculated fib of 3 here. Basically, your fib of 4 function and fib of 3 function, they both will execute. Fib of 4 function has fib of 3 and fib of 2. Fib of 3 will already be executed by our program. But here it is executed again. You can see this whole thing, fib of 3, fib of 2, 1, 2, 1, 0. And this is exactly same. This is a repetition. Our program is doing this twice. We don't want this to happen. See this fib of 1, 2, 0 is also getting repetitive repetition. We don't want this to happen. If we can somehow store this value, this value here, whatever the return value, this is what the return value of fib 3 is. It will be fib 1 plus fib 0 plus fib 1, that is 2. If you can store it somewhere in an array, suppose, then if we encounter it here, we can just put that as the answer and we don't have to calculate this. So a, a number of operations will be reduced by a lot. So, so that's what we are going to do here. This is our recursive. So this is our uh, fib2, okay. And this is our fib2 recursive. Here our recursive function will take place. And this is just, uh, this is not, uh, this is just starting basically it's almost main function. So here from the main function, we'll send, let's say, suppose we want to find fib of phi. So we'll call fib2 of phi from the main function. So fib2 will accept phi as the input. Okay. We'll make an array of size 6 and we'll put fib0 as 0. Okay. For 0 to n, basically, we'll put all of the elements as 0. All the so initially, what what this array is? This array is supposed to be uh, the fifth values of any number, which we'll calculate here. Okay, so uh, suppose initially we don't know the fifth value of any because because we haven't executed the recursive function yet. So we set all of them to zero. Okay. And we set ARR of 1 and ARR 2 to 1 because that is the base case. What we are doing is FIB 0, uh, basically we are setting FIB 0 as 0, FIB 1 as 1, and FIB 2 as 1 as the base case. And uh, other things we'll calculate in the FIB 2 recursive. So from here, we'll go to return FIB 2 recursive, comma, n, comma, r. So basically, this will go to this function control flow. It'll take the number n, which Let's say it was phi. We need to find Fibonacci of phi. 
okay and it will take the array which has all elements 0 it's of size n plus 1 and which we, we will use to store the answer okay so if array of uh, array of 5 is not equal to 0 return array of 5 basically since array of 5 is 0 as we initialize all of them to 0 because we haven't found them at yet so this is not uh, this is a uh, this will return this will a statement will not execute we we'll, we come here we'll say that array of phi is uh, we, we call the fifth to recursive function again we use the same thing here just we pass the whole array and instead of n we do n plus 1 plus fifth to recursive n plus 2 since fibonacci of array of n will contain fibonacci of n and fibonacci of n is fibonacci of n minus 1 plus fibonacci of n minus 2 so similar to the this this problem we are storing this value in arr of n and we'll return arr of n after we get the value so what will happen here is uh, this fib2 recursive will execute with this arr and with uh, n minus for n minus 1 that is 4 and for n minus 1 2 that is 3 this will keep on going and let's say this this executes first let's say this executes the second one executes first and uh, let's say the second one executes first and we get the value of fifth three stored in the r array at arr of three and when this fifth two recursive is processing it breaks into fifth four, breaks into fifth three and fifth two, but we have already calculated fifth three here. So this thing won't be calculated again and will be taken directly from array of n. Thus our computation will be reduced by a lot basically. As you can see like this whole thing won't happen, only this will happen and this will probably also not happen because fifth two will be uh, is already stored. So this is a, uh, this reduces our computation by a lot. Now, as you can see here, the this is the time taken by the first code. OK, this one. And this is the time taken by the second code to calculate Fibonacci of 5. For the small numbers, there's almost no difference. For Fibonacci of 30, see, this is uh, much bigger than this. So here's the QR code for a poll it's actually a guess poll i need you to tell me how much the fibonacci of 40 how much faster is the second method to find the fibonacci of 40 can it uh? it's actually a guess only so No need to think over it much. It's just a guess. Okay, looks like the polls have. Oh, happening. Guys, right, it's a guess pool. You don't need to think any a lot. Just think what you what it could be.
It looks like the poles are stabilized. So the answer is shockingly D. The 40 is almost five. The second method is almost 5,000 times faster compared to the first method. As you can see, it's only the number 40 and we have uh, five. We are 5,000 times faster with the second method. For bigger number, second method is way, way exponentially faster than the first method. So the correct answer is uh, D. So let's continue with the session. So let's now start GCD. Say most uh, GCD is the largest positive integer which divides two or more number without leaving a remainder. Basically, it's the largest common divisor of two or more numbers. So it's used in a variety of application. That's just fine only. We'll, for competitive programming, there's a built-in function in C++ STL called, called underscore underscore GCD A comma B. Basically, A and B are the two elements, numbers. Suppose you want to find GCD between three elements. What you will do is underscore underscore GCD A comma uh, G underscore underscore GCD of B comma C. Basically, you'll find of of two and then put it in here and find with the third. You can do like that. So it only takes two elements. That is what I wanted to say. So this underscore underscore GCD is a built-in function in C++ STL, but we'll learn how to do, how to code the GCD function ourselves. So the best method to do this is Euclidean algorithm. And there's actually a, a better version of Euclidean algorithm called binary Euclidean algorithm. And there's a prime factorization version. So the prime, what is prime factorization version? In this version, we take the common prime factors between the two numbers. Basically, we prime factorize them and take the common prime factors and we common and those common prime factors are the GCD. Basically, it's like how you uh, prime factorizes and take the comp. Sorry. So prime factorization is a, hmm, is a method for finding GCD, but it's not the most optimal method. You'll have to write a prime function for that and uh, you need to store it somewhere. Then you need to compare between those prime factors the powers and that's uh, not a very good solution. We have a better method called Euclidean algorithm and there's an even better method of that binary Euclidean algorithm. This is just an optimized version of the Euclidean algorithm, which is a bitwise operation to perform divisions by two and it eliminates common powers of two. Basically, it the powers of two can be eliminated by bitwise operations. But uh, since uh, bitwise is not the part of our discussion. So we are not seeing this method. So Euclidean algorithm is what we are going to see. So you might have learned this in school that this Euclid division lemma, that is A equals to B into Q plus R, where A is the dividend, B is the divisor, Q is the quotient, and R is the remainder, right? So let's say the GCD of A and B B G. Okay. So in this equation, we can clearly see that G can will divide A. Since G divides B, G will divide B into Q. That that means G must also divide R. Since uh, all of them are added, let's suppose you uh, divide both sides by G. A, A will give zero remainder, but this side must also give zero remainder. Since G is the GCD of A and B, it divides B obviously. So this is also zero remainder with G. So R must also be zero remainder with G. So what we notice here is the remainder which comes when A, uh, the remainder which comes when the two numbers are uh, divided 
with each other. Let's say we want to find GCD between A and B, and A is the smaller one. So remainder will be uh, when uh, uh, let's say B is the smaller one. So remainder when will be the remainder when A is divided by B, basically. So we can see that that is also divisible by the GCD of A and B. That is the main point of the Euclidean algorithm. This is by division. This also by subtraction will be seen a little while in a little while. So by division, we can see like this. We have two numbers. We'll be calling the GCD function. We call, I'll just, we'll store the value in the HCF. So what this GCD function does is, now we already learned recursion. Let's see how to recursively imply GCD function. So since if B equals B equals to zero, okay. Uh, see if B is zero, then uh, R will be equals to A only. Like we set the base base, base case, okay. Uh, here, num1 and num2, I forgot to mention, but uh, just take num1 as the greater one and num2 as the smaller one, okay? So, A is greater than B in the here. So, if B is 0, basically, we are having two numbers. That is, one is 0 and one is non-zero. So, we will just put that uh, GCD of that number is A. Basically, uh, GCD of 3,0 is 3. Since 3 divides 3 and 3 divides 0. It's a little weird, but that's the thing with 0. Otherwise, the GCD is always less than both of them, except in the 0th case. So let's say we want to find GCD between 3 and 5. So we'll be calling this function with 3 and 5. Since uh, 5 and 3, sorry. Since B is 3 and 3 is not 0. So, so this if statement won't execute. Else statement will execute. It is basically GCD B comma A percent B. So what is this? Uh, it initially it was three five comma three. Now it's three comma uh, five percent three. That is five modulo three. That is two three comma two GCD of three comma two. You could have all also put here GCD of A comma A percent B. That would have not made a difference because GCD of uh, A and B is equal to GCD of A percent B. So GCD of B comma A percent B is same as GCD of A comma A percent B. But since the B is the smaller one, to make less calculations and to for faster uh, for getting our answer faster, we are taking the smaller one instead of A comma A percent B. So we are returning B comma A percent B CD. So now since it was 5 and 3, now it is 3 and 2. Okay, so now 3 and 2 are here. 2 is not 0, so else statement will be executed. So now 2 will be here, and 3 percent 2 is 1. Okay, now 2 and 1 will be there. 1 is not 0. Uh, this will be 1, and this will be 1, 2 percent 1, that is 0, since 2 is divisible 1. So GCD of 1 comma 0, uh, now B is zero, so return one. So one. Since we all, since we know GCD of five comma three is one, we got that as the answer. So let's take for three comma six. Uh, let no no. Let's take for three comma six. The answer we should get is three, right? So let's say six comma three. The bigger one is A, smaller one is B. Six comma three. Three is not zero. We will be returning three comma six percent three. What is 6% 3? 0. 6 mod 3 is 0. So this GCD function will call again with 3 as 0 as the parameters. Since B is 0, we'll be returning A. That is 3. And so we calculated the GCD. You of using equi Euclidean algorithm by division. There's also another method by subtraction. This might take a little longer than this, but this is fine only. I don't think there would be much difference. In this, the main idea is that uh, if there's a num, the greatest common divisor of A and B divides A and B, so it must also divide A minus B. That is obvious since uh, 
let's if a is bigger than b so gcd of a and gcd of b will divide a minus b since it divide both of them individually so here if it is if they are same so we'll return one of them let's just return a if uh, a is greater than b then we'll be returning a minus b comma b if b is greater than a then we'll be returning a comma b minus a since uh, we all since this one uh, since b minus a will be positive if b is greater than a and a minus b will be positive if uh, a is greater than b so we don't want to run into negatives here so the difference we will take is the positive difference and this uh, return function will keep doing just like the division here this return will keep uh, happening and uh, we'll finally get the correct answer Uh, just like I said last time, you can write here A as well, but what B is smaller, so that's better. There is a brute force method, which is the worst complexity. The time complexity of this is some uh, O log minimum of A plus comma B, but that's not what we, that is something complex and we won't be going into that. That's a requires some complex mathematics. Uh, this is brute force method. As you can see, what this method does, it it is not a, a recursive method. What it does is just just basically it checks all the number from one to whatever is the minimum of them, and check if which is the greatest one which divides both of them. So, let's say minimum of a and b is b. Int minimum. If a is greater than b, then b is minimum is b, else minimum is a. And from the minimum, since we already know that uh, GCD must be less than or equal to minimum of A or B, because like if it's greater than one of them, then it can't divide the other, right? Except for zero case. So from there, we'll keep iterating till uh, till number one. And if we find a number which divides both of them, we'll return it. And if we don't find a number which divides both both of them, basically if they both are co-prime numbers, this uh, return. This if statement will never be executed and will come out of this for loop and will basically return one, which is the GCD of com, uh, co prime numbers. This is, uh, we're not discussing this. So basically, the recap is uh, functions, recursion, GCD. The functions are blocks of code which are written for repeated users. Uh, we can use uh, recursions a lot of time as iterations, but there are some many times that uh, we can't find writing recursion is much e many times writing recursion is much simpler than writing iteration because uh, uh, we if we already have the recursive function for it. So what does recursion include? It's, it includes a function calling itself. It, it includes a base case, which is usually trained at the start of the function. And a function after executing returns to the callee, basically, finally. And what this GCD is, uh, we basically use the recursive implementation by Euclid division algorithm. This is the best one to use. And inbuilt is, we use inbuilt underscore underscore GCD a comma b function in contest for if we don't need, if we just need GCD between two numbers. Sometimes we might need to, to calculate some other things. That's why it's important to know how to implement GCD using Euclid's division algorithm, because sometimes they might ask some things which might require you to actually implement the uh, GCD function. But in most of the times, we'll be using underscore underscore GCD as the function as for calculating GCD. So this is the attendance form. This is last attendance for the session.
okay i hope this is enough time for attendance if don't get it it might the attendance link might be in the slido and this is a slido link this 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 you are you uh, after this uh, session ends just uh, rate the session on the poll in the slido link Okay, so I hope the session is went well. Thank you. Have a nice day.